When HBO premiered the show Eastbound and Down in 2009, viewers got hooked on the character Kenny Powers, a lovably offensive, bad mouth pro baseball burnout, and followed each step of his hilarious and painful self inflicted fall from grace. One of the masterminds behind the character is the show's executive producer, Will Ferrell, who years before it premiered impersonated a guy named John Rocker on SNL. I'm John Rocker. Here to launch us into a new millennium with a message of peace and love. According to some, this ball player, John Rocker, is the real Kenny Powers. His reputation exploded after he made what many considered to be offensive and racist comments during an interview with Sports Illustrated. About my presumed hatred for the people of New York, the comments I made over six months ago offended many people. I'm not the evil person that has been portrayed, and when given the opportunity, many people who actually know me have spoken out strongly on my behalf. So we're walking through the Hall of Fame event here in Cooperstown, New York. I'm hanging out with John Rocker. He's a total character. Surprisingly, given his reputation, which obviously precedes him, people love him here. He has the longest lines for autographs. Um, it's pretty hysterical. You're a Braves fan? I am, a big one. Do you know a guy by the name of John Rocker? I do know John Rocker. He's going to pitch 100 miles an hour even on a slow ball. I personally think he's one of the best closers in the business. He's one of the most interesting human beings on the planet Earth. And he's a racist. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. I said it. I said it. I moved from Manhattan down to Atlanta, so I, I, the things he said about New York City, I, I, it didn't set well. What's he doing now? Anybody know? Do you remember what you were thinking about each time you ran out onto the mound? That I wanted to shove it up somebody's ass. I just, I want to fuck you up. Did you watch Eastbound and Down? Every once in a while, I've seen a few episodes. You ever get people saying, hey, all the time. you're the real Kenny Powers? Uh, all the time. We were born in the same hospital in Statesboro, Georgia. You and Danny McBride? Yeah, Bullock County Hospital. Some little things, you know, there's like 10 births a year in this hospital. And I was, I was 174, he was 176. Do you think that you inspired the character? from Will doing the skits on me for, I think he did probably two or three of them. And, uh, yeah, I, I would say probably so. Come on, New York! Hate me and boo! Because I know I'm a good man when the devil hates me! I am John Rocker! I'll fight all of you, you cesspool of homo race traitors! I'm gonna piss on you, New York! What do you think of those SNL skits? Funny as shit. Last time I saw Will was... I don't know, probably eight, nine years ago uh, at Park. And we sat there and had a, uh, me and him and a buddy of mine and Molly Shannon sat there and had a drink. And we, we, we shot the shit about those kids. It was funny. How do you feel about the comparison when watching the show? It's fun. You know, it's fun. Yeah. You know, at, least, at, least they, at least they make it funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Your life seems pretty funny. Yeah, you know, it, it, can, it can be humorous. I just got done uh, filming that TV show Survivor. Yeah, it's yeah. gone for like two oh, months. And I just, I can't get myself back in gear. So I'm just like, nice. work or screw off and play golf. Yeah, we'll start right. play golf again. <laughs> so we're at a charity golf tournament that John Walker's playing in. And he's uh, not exactly on his A game, so I'm starting to get a little frustrated. That's not going to be near enough. That stinks. <laughs> I'm going to call my chiropractor now, tell him to be ready for me. I'll be there at three. <sighs> you know, that's going to be too short. Too damn short. Get some touch, you idiot. Long green. What'd I tell you? I'm hell out of the woods. On the fairway, I suck. Out of the woods, you run for your money. I stink. I'm no good. That's what happened. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't fix socks. There you go, Cuckin. Keep them coming, brother. See, look, look, at the, look at the difference there. See how clear that one is? You know what that one is? That's a good drink. That, that, that's going to make my fucking nipple stiff right there. It will. John invited us to a night out in Cooperstown. He's clearly still a big hit with baseball fans everywhere. Great pitcher, great Raider, great guy. Oh, Mets. Go dogs, sick em. I think the last time I had inappropriate sex with a stripper in uh, in, uh, in New Orleans, I used a baseball sock for a condom. 
It wasn't much better than I'd ever done. You ever get sick of the attention? You really have no choice. Most people would consider your controversial comments to have adversely affected you, but do you think in some ways they keep you relevant? Media portrays me in a negative light. In my opinion, a lot of media is a um, and that damn is just an absolute just bigger than ignorant jackass. Um, and those comments I mean that there's, there's not a story much sexier than bigotry. I mean, that, that shit sells, which in my opinion, this is from analyzing this shit from 20 different angles for 15 fucking years, you know, why are they so adamantly just stuck to it? I, I dated a black, a black girl for three years. She lived with me for a year and a half. She's from Chelsea, she lived in Chelsea, New York. Gayest segment of New York City, you know? The media insisted it was a PR stunt. She lived with me. You know, after hearing all the stuff that was said about him, about the comments he made about New York and all that kind of stuff, you know, everybody had their opinion. But for me as a player, I, I done met a whole bunch of different kind of people. You know, playing 17 years in the big leagues and, um, I didn't pay any of that stuff attention then, and I don't now, but when I first met him, he was a baseball guy. He was a good guy. He was, you know, he, he, he does everything that all of us do. Do you think that any of the claims of people saying you're racist, or bigot, et cetera, any of that in any way valid? Is it even valid? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No. John got drafted right out of high school. He was a young, talented player with lots of potential. You're a little minor league kid. Your confidence and self-doubt and lack of confidence and everything is, is something you struggle with every day. Am I good enough? One day you're on top of the world because you pitched a great game. The next day you shit the bed and you're like, fuck, I'm, I'm going to be selling used cars or pumping gas, you know, before the summer's out. I mean, it's just it's, it's a constant mental battle back and forth, back and forth. At age 22, John was playing a minor league game in Puerto Rico when he got a shot to prove himself. I'm like, all right. So I, mean, I knew what I was down there for. They were down there to see, okay, it's, I was down there to basically sink or swim, kind of like the, you know, the Chinese teach their kids how to swim. I heave them in the pool and say, good luck, son. So get, in, get in town. Don't pitch the first two or three days. They want me to kind of get accommodated and whatever else. And so the, the third game, we had just gotten, we're the home team, so we just gotten their team out. And pitch coach comes down and says, Pudge Rodriguez is hitting is hitting fourth. If we get to him, you got it. Pudge, he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. By this point in time, he had been in the big leagues maybe six years. He had won like six gold gloves. I think he won a batting title already. He was a four or five time all-star. I mean, he's a fucking stud. But at the time, I was 22 years old. I'd never faced a big league hitter. And I'm like, oh, really? My first is the five-time all-star <laughs> batting champion already. This is going to be my first. Holy fuck. So I'm heaving now. I'm fucking heaving, getting ready, loose. And uh, I think the next guy got out. Who the fuck knows? And I just kind of turn around. And my manager's walking out of the field. And this is his left hand. And without even thinking about it, I just, <laughs> just wide off. It was, it, was, I mean, it was time to find out if 10 years of busting my ass was if, 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 you know, if I was going to fucking make a player. And what happened? I punched Pudge out on a one-two slider down and in. Yeah, pretty excited, Coach. Yeah, I just I just faced my first big league hitter and then and struck him out on four pitches. That's where it came from, and just just kind of stuck. And I'm like, I like that mentality. That's pretty good. Maybe I'll keep that. So. What would it feel like to strike him out? Oh, it was it was, it was awesome. I can I can still see. I can, in my mind's eye, I can still see the pitch right now. <laughs> John was pulled up to the big leagues at the young age of 24. Clearly, a rising star. Yeah, I can remember the, the, probably the first day I was on a big league field. And looking up at the, I mean, it's just, it's a cathedral around you. You're like, holy shit, man. And just thinking, they can't ever take this away from me. Um, you know, I mean, a, a decade of every single day. I mean, the tens of thousands of hours. Like, I can't, and that, that may be, you know, an understatement. Um, you know, 10 years. And my philosophy was, even as like a 13, 14 year old kid, I have to do something every day to play in the big leagues, every day. You know, whether it was working out, stretching, playing, reading a book, reading a magazine, watching a game, something. I had to do something every single day, and, and did. Uh, I would say maybe 365-day calendar year, 345 days was doing something for baseball. John and I are going to go play some catch on a baseball field. Are you going to show me some moves? Mm-hmm. 
She's gonna play catch, I'm gonna play chase the ball. <laughs> Get my cardio in too. You're gonna show me your slider? I will. You think I can pick it up? No? Um, I, was, I, I, was, I was having to overcome an obnoxious comment. I was like, you're gonna show me your slider? <laughs> <laughs> What are you doing here? I'll take this bolt out. Yeah, no, I think I'll do. Let's hop it. I don't think it'll be that tough. Wait, can you? Yeah, thanks. Oh, oh shit. Oh. <laughs> nice. Well, let's play some cash. What was your favorite type pitch? Um, equally between my fastball and my slider. Show, show, show my hip to you as long as I can. <laughs> All right, you do the same thing. If you, okay, ready? You, you leg kick, show that hip as long as you can. Ride that hip. There you go, ride it. There you go. What's the key to being a good closer? Uh, consistency. You know, not being the guy that can go in and strike out the side on 10 pitches one night and walk the house the next. At the height of John's career, he did an interview with Sports Illustrated, and it sent a shockwave through the sports world, mostly due to controversial comments he made about New York City and the people that live there. Do you think that uh, you kind of taking on that persona when you were a player contributed to you eventually leaving the big leagues? Uh, no, the scars on my shoulder contributed to leaving the big leagues. Um, they diagnosed the pinched nerve in my neck, but nobody had anything to fix it. They just said, okay, the shoulder, and the shoulder was just jacked. The, the nerve is still there, it still hurts, I mean, it's hurting right now. It would take me 30 minutes of stretching and 15 minutes of throwing to get loose to throw one inning and throw 86 miles an hour. I'm like, there's, there's some issues here, we gotta check this out. What, what started out to be an arthroscopic deal uh, turned out to be a four and a half hour surgery. Um, you've got five rotary cuff muscles, two of mine were 85% torn. Mm. My labrum was torn off the bone, my capsule was stretched out by an inch and a half. I had bone spurs, all my chromium, and my shoulder was just destroyed. Mm -hmm. and, um, I mean, you couldn't pitch like that, and then once I got fixed, I couldn't pitch like that either. So, mm -hmm. And if I couldn't throw 100 miles an hour, I wouldn't be good to anybody. You were talking earlier about that kind of uh, mentality of, am I good enough? Am I going to be you know, working at a gas station in a few months? Is my career going to last? Do you think that media and uh, fans that taunted you uh, affected your performance? I was leading the National League in saves when I got traded. I think I was 23 of 24 saves and won one save all year. And they're going to have an ERA, you know, somewhere in the low mid twos. Um, you know, I went through several playoff series after that, uh, and to this day, 22 and a third playoff innings have never given up a run in the playoffs. Um, you know, didn't really start struggling until this the shoulder started, you know, started going south. So, you know, they, the haters love to, I guess, in some way, shape, or form, think that because of their hatred and their vitriol and whatever else, that they, in in some way, shape, or form, in some part had something to do with, you know, with my demise, but, you know, check the stats. It's just not the case. Although John has a clear disdain for the media due to the negative attention he's gotten over the years, he's still been willing to appear in the limelight since leaving the majors. He recently appeared on the reality show Survivor, getting kicked off when fellow contestants discovered his controversial past. How do you respond to that, though? And I think that's important because a lot of people do just read those articles, right? They don't, they don't get the opportunity to meet you like we have. But when people say, you're racist, you're a bigot, how do you respond? Oh, well, I guess you think I know. Whatever you think. But, like, what's the reality of the situation? I mean, just what, what can you say, you know? I know, I know? I know who I am. My friends know who I am. I told you in Cooperstown, there's about six or seven people that actually care what you think about me. And if those people are good with me, then I'm good with me. You know, you can't, you can't change the world overnight. Um... You know, I live my life, I think I live my life pretty good. I've got staunch views on, on some things, and I think if, if, you know, if people just wanted to be, you know, so rudimentary, so naive, so sheepish, um, that they just want to read that SI article and just accept what Jeff Perlman has to say and, and ignore the fact that, that Mr. Perlman has done to me, maybe not in the vein of racism or bigotry or whatever, he's done to me what he's done to 30 other subjects that he's written about. And, you know, take it with a grain of salt and maybe let me do a little more research into John Rocker and find what he actually has to say, not the cut and splice version that, you know, Jeff Perlman tries to portray. Despite John's rejection of how he's often portrayed, he does have some practices that still raise eyebrows, particularly his Speak English campaign. Now, I started that as, as encouraging immigrants who, who want to come over here and make a life over here. 
the only way you can truly enjoy and, and experience everything America has to offer, all the prosperity and everything like that, is to assimilate yourself. Assimilate yourself to the culture, the heritage, yada, yada, yada. Something that I kept wondering is for a guy trying to counter a negative opinion of himself, why would he do things that very obviously piss people off? Do you think that if you weren't a controversial person, uh, that you would be getting called for survivor and uh, getting opportunities that you're I don't, getting? I don't, I won't just say controversial. I think I'm controversial uh, in certain, depending on who you talk to. Um, I think I'm polarizing. You still may not agree with some of my views and some of my politics and, and, and my speak English campaign and things like that. You may not agree with it. Um, it doesn't really make me controversial. I think it just makes me polarizing. You don't agree with it. Well, there's a lot of people that do. I think everyone's wondering what's John Rocker doing right now. I'm trying to help as many vets as I can get off the street, uh, get a warm meal in their stomach, get a job, get an education if that's what they want, um, and hopefully usher them back out in the society as um, you know, meaningful, productive members uh, and get, 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 uh, get back on with their lives. Hi, this is former Atlanta Brave closer, John Rocker. I'm at Cool Ray Field, home of the Gwinnett Braves, where this Sunday, October 26th, I'll be hosting a charity softball game between myself, my former Atlanta Brave teammates, versus a team of military all-stars benefiting my charity, Save Homeless Veterans. Hope to see you here Sunday, October 26th. Gates open at 12.30. John's been accused of using PR stunts to bolster his image in the past, so we decided to give him a fair shot and meet some of the veterans ourselves. You know, a lot of these guys out there in transition looking for work. It may take them two months, it may take them six months. They got a place they can you know, kind of piggyback off Tom and, and you know, make, you know, make a couple thousand dollars a month. You know. When I got out the service, man, hey, they tell you nothing. All they do is say, all right, we'll see you later. If I want things to be better, I got to start with myself first. And how have John and Save Homeless Veterans helped you do that? Well, first of all, they got me out the park. Just getting used to living in a park and being homeless it was almost normal to where almost like to hell with society. Our title is Save Homeless Veterans. Yeah. We do a lot more than that. It's roughly around 2,600 homeless veterans. Uh, we've aligned ourselves or partnered ourselves with VA and uh, we're out looking for homeless veterans to provide them with shelter, to provide them with jobs, with good counseling. A lot of these soldiers are very down, discouraged. They've dealt with a lot of terrible things on the field. So what we try to do is provide them a place to live. We tell you, John has a tender heart, and he probably is gonna be angry that I've said that. He believes that this will work if you follow the program, you take the steps, you take the time to invest yourself into yourself. These programs are out there for people that are struggling, that need help, need assistance, need a foundation, need a base need the commission, need the, uh, the, the camaraderie, the connection. These programs like this one where we just, you know, they're out there to help. Everyone that we've talked to who's involved with Save, Save Homeless Veterans has talked about how they would not be able to do what they're doing without you. So can you just explain a little bit about why you care so much uh, about this cause? For those kind of folks, those martyrs, those that, that you know, through, in my opinion, no far their own trying to do the good thing, have ended up in a really, really bad place. And it's because society has basically just turned their back on them. You know, and I found nobody else that was doing this. John really does seem genuine about this issue. And when we spent time with these veterans, they kept talking about how thankful they were for the work that John has done. It's easy to reduce his persona to the notorious statements he made as a young guy, but perhaps there's more to it than that. I played with many guys that uh, had better careers than me, and I always uh, use the name Mark Wollers. Mark had a tremendous career. Um, you know, he, he had a better career than I did, he, and I love Mark to death, but very bland, very vanilla. He's not polarizing any one side or the other, certainly not controversial. Um, you know, he could start something like a Save Homeless Veterans. It, it would take him 10 years to get to where I've gotten into, um, just because, simply because he just not, does not have the name recognition to pick up the phone, talk to Survivor, yeah, I'll do your show. And next thing you know, 13 million people view me on a weekly basis. And you know, out of those 13 million, um, how many millions are going to know about Save Homeless Veterans? A lot. When we were talking uh, at the start of our conversation and you were describing what it was like to run out into the field and see the whole stadium and all the, the people there, um, and you got kind of emotional, like you got teary-eyed. Yeah, that's all I ever wanted to do. Yeah. So, yeah, when, when, you, when you, you finally find something that that, uh, you know, just, just moves you that much and you just love it so much, you know. 
Um, and then, you know, you'll, you'll never be there again. That's, that's, the, that's the real shit kicker. I'll never see that again.